Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the sense of, uh, of sight, vision, all right? So this is by our eye, obviously. Uh, so this is the organ of vision. Uh, sight is our most dominant sense. 70% of our sensory receptors in the body are actually found in our eye. So we have about 250 million photoreceptors in our eye. And, fell, and fully half of our cerebral cortex is involved in vision in some way. Now the diameter of the eye is about an inch, two and a half uh, centimeters uh, in diameter. Uh, so just to, if you've ever heard this rumor, our eyes do grow, uh, you know, as you know, we go from a baby and so on. So they grow with the skull, just like everything else. Um, now let's take a look at some accessory structures. Uh, these accessory structures are going to protect and aid the eyes functioning. So first, what we can see right here at the top are eyebrows. These are short, coarse hairs that overlie the eyes. Uh, they have several functions for us. One is they block sunlight, and they also prevent perspiration from getting into the eyes. Um, and obviously, they are used in nonverbal communication as well. Next are the eyelids, uh, which are also known as palpebrae. So if we go to this, this, is a sagittal section through the eye and through the eyelids there. Uh, these are the protective coverings of the eyes. Uh, the skin on the eyelid is, is actually the thinnest on the body. Uh, and it's also what we have in here, skeletal muscle tissue and connective tissue there. Uh, we blink every three to seven seconds, and that's to prevent the drying of the eyes and the eyelids, and that's a reflex. Uh, on the edges of those eyelids are eyelashes. These are hairs that protect the free margin of the eyelid. They're highly innervated, a lot of nerve endings in there, and if they are touched, that's going to cause a reflex that causes us to blink. Um, if we go to this picture here, we're going to look at this stuff right there. Let's go back to this picture here. Right there is the uh, lacrimal curvicle. So this contains sebaceous glands and sweat glands, and it produces a white, oily secretion. And so when this dries, uh, that produces the sand that gets into people's eyes, right? Um, if we go back here, the inner lining of the eyelid, it comes over on the white of our eye, which is known as the sclera. Uh, that is the conjunctiva. So there's a mucous membrane that covers the uh, eye and the inner eyelid. It does not cover over the cornea, which is the clear, transparent part of our eye. Next are the lacrimal glands. So lacrimal glands are located here. You can see those. So lacrimal glands, these are glands that secrete tears. And we secrete tears all the time. And those tears are going to come out in little ducts, and they're going to wash across our eye, and they're going to drain out onto the medial side of our eye into a couple of these small little ducts. All right. So the function of tears is that they lubricate the surface of the eye and the eyelids. And they also have another cleansing function in that they uh, contain an enzyme called lysozyme. And so this is an enzyme that actually helps kill off bacteria. Oh, lysozyme is also found in our saliva. Uh, next, uh, this duct system here. Um, uh, you know, the really only thing I want you to know about this is this duct system are going to drain those tears into our nasal cavity. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, this is comp, you know, this is what we constantly do. We make tears, they drain into our nasal cavity, and from our nasal cavity, uh, they go to our throat, and then I just swallowed some tears uh, with anything else that I swallowed there. Okay, so this is what commonly occurs. So, uh, now, if you have a situation in which you cry, what you might notice is you don't just get tears being produced on your face, you also notice that your nose gets stuffy, and the reason your nose gets stuffy is because tears are draining into your nasal cavity because of that. All right, so next are the extrinsic eye muscles. So these are shown those extrinsic eye muscles. These are six muscles that move the eyes. Uh, if somebody has diplopia, uh, that's double vision, that's, uh, they're gonna have a weakness in certain of those eye muscles, so it's hard to focus there for them. All right, let's go back to uh, the eye here and look at its structure. So we have three layers to the eye that you can see on here. One, two, three layers. And that outermost layer uh, is known uh, as the outer tunic. It's also known as the fibrous tunic. And that's because it's made of an avascular connective tissue, which is mainly fibers. In the front of the eye, we have the cornea. So uh, the cornea is an anterior transparent bulge in the front of the eye. 
and it helps to focus incoming light rays. Uh, next is a sclera. So this right here is a sclera. That is the white portion of the eye. Uh, it is made of collagenous and elastic fibers, and that's what gives it its color. All right, and it's going to protect these underlying tissues. It is a tough fibrous connective tissue covering. Uh, and so we know this because if you've ever got a conjunctiva, which is, you know, uh, sorry, conjunctivitis, uh, that's an inflammation of the conjunctiva. So if we go back to this picture here, there's the conjunctiva right next to the sclera. The, you know, you can have pink eye, which is a type of conjunctivitis, but that infection isn't getting into the eye because if it could, it could damage our retina, which would cause blindness. So anytime we have a tough fibrous connective tissue covering around an organ, it's preventing infections from spreading into that organ. So such as the dura mater around our brain and spinal cord. Okay, so lastly, it's also an attachment for those extrinsic eye muscles. All right, underneath the fibrous tunic is a vascular tunic, which you see here in that darker line right there. And then you see it enlarge here into the front of the eye. So in the back part of the eye, uh, that is the choroid. So the choroid is a vascular pigmented middle layer of the wall of the eye. It has many blood vessels and is loosely joined to the sclera. Uh, it also has melanocytes in there. And the melanocytes produce melanin, which is going to absorb excess light that gets into the eye. Now, if we follow the choroid to the front of the eye, we see it enlarge in this area, in that area there. And that is what is known as the ciliary body. So this is an internal ring around the front of the eye. So if we go to this other picture, this enlargement of the ciliary body, uh, this is showing the whole ciliary body right there and the lens in the middle of it, all right? So if we go back to this picture, so there's the ciliary body, we see a few structures on this. One are these ciliary processes here. So those ciliary processes uh, secrete a fluid that uh, into the interior of the eye. And we'll talk about that fluid later on. What's attached to those are suspensory ligaments, and those suspensory ligaments are gonna hold the lens in place. And then up here, you see these ciliary muscles, and those ciliary muscles are gonna adjust the shape of the lens. So let's look at the lens, all right? So the lens is a structure that condenses light onto the retina. So if I move uh, to this picture here, this is showing the lens there. So it is clear membrane-like structure composed of intercellular material. And so this process of focusing, what we do when we focus is what is known as accommodation. This is adjustment of the lens for close or distant vision. So what happens when our, uh, with our lens is we're if we look at something far away, our lens flattens out. All right, so, you know, uh, students in my classroom, when they look at the board, their lens is gonna flatten out. But when they look at something close, that lens is gonna thicken up for that closed vision. So when you look down at a, uh, at a book, all right, your lens is gonna uh, uh, thicken up for that close vision, flattens for distant vision. So here's one of the things that can happen to us as we age is that like everything else in our body, our lens becomes less elastic with time. And because it becomes less elastic, it won't thicken as well. Uh, and this leads to a lot of us having to use reading glasses as we get older. All right, so uh, next is the iris. So uh, yeah, so this part right here, let's go back to this picture here. So there is the iris right there. So uh, the iris is a thin diaphragm that is the colored portion of the eye. And what the diaphragm does is it controls the amount of light that enters the eye, all right? And so we have this hole, this opening in the middle of the eye, and that is the pupil. So this is a circular opening in the center of the eye or the center of the iris. And we have two sets of muscles in the iris that are gonna control the size of the pupil. So if we go to uh, this picture, this shows two of those, uh, those muscles, but let's go to a larger muscle there. So if we look at the first set, which I'm gonna call the circular set, this is the inner set of muscles. All right, and when these contract, they're circular muscles that go around. So when they contract, that pupil is going to get smaller. All right, so uh, this is typically caused by when we go into a situation in which there's a lot of bright light around, like this room or outside on a sunny day, our pupils get smaller. And that's because there's a lot of light out there. We don't need a lot of that light coming into our eyes because it makes it harder to see. 
This is controlled by our parasympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system. All right. Uh, the other set of muscles are called the radial set. So these are the outer ones. Now these are straight muscles, so when they contract, the pupil uh, dilates. All right. So this is typically done when we move into a darkened room. Uh, our pupils will dilate, so we allow more light in, so we can see more. All right. And this is controlled by our sympathetic division. Now I do want to point out, when the uh, radial set is contract, our circular set is relaxed, and when the circular set contracts, our radial set of muscles is relaxed. All right. So there are other ways in which uh, our um, uh, so it might not always be lighting that adjusts the the, um, the size of the pupil. There are other reasons these might change. One is if you find something appealing or you're doing some problem solving, your pupils will dilate. Uh, and this even comes to uh, if you find somebody attractive, your pupils will dilate as well. Uh, if you're bored or repulsed, uh, your pupils will constrict. So uh, that is another indication that we uh, subconsciously give to people. All right, let's take a look at uh, iris color. So the color of the iris. The color of the iris is due to a couple things, but mainly it's due to the amount of melanin that is found uh, in the iris. All right. Uh, the other thing that could influence it is density of the iris tissue. So if you produce a lot of melanin, uh, you're going to have brown to black eyes. If you produce very little melanin, you're going to have blue eyes. So if you have uh, a little bit more melanin than blue, you have green eyes, a little bit more uh, melanin than green, you have hazel, a little bit more, you have light brown, a little bit more, you have dark brown, and so on. Okay. Now, uh, eye color is a polygenic trait, meaning there's more than one gene that controls this. So this is why you can have, um, you know, uh, one parent has blue eyes, another has brown. You can have kids of colors in between there uh, on that spectrum. So uh, people who have gray eyes have a dense iris. 